redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's a marvelous theme. Different melody, but a marvelous theme. Words by Fanny Crosby. And uh, fascinating to think of a woman who is totally blind, writing thousands of songs during her lifetime that are still blessing the church today. You know, things that we do can have an impact, can't they? We talked about that this morning. How our works demonstrate our salvation. They don't get us saved, but they demonstrate it. And they can be a blessing to others. And certainly the hymns of Fanny Crosby, many of which we don't have in our hymnals, of course, but uh, they're in some hymnals. Every one of them was published. And uh, at some point, they were a blessing to thousands of people. So what are you doing that will be a blessing to thousands of people? Anything? <laughs> Think about it. What could you do that would be a blessing to thousands of people, perhaps for years to come? Fanny Crosby died many years ago, but her music lives on. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to Acts chapter 20. This is Farewell to Ephesus, part two tonight. It's a rather interesting passage, and we, we talked about seven different approaches that you can use on that passage. We're going to, we gave an overview last week, and we're going to start dissecting it a little piece at a time this week, the Lord willing. And hopefully if I get back on time, we'll continue the dissection next week. <laughs> Pray for that safety on that trip. So uh, anyway, we're in Acts chapter 20 and looking at verses 13 through 38. And we went before to ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over to Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Tregilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Therefore, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought 
to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are the God who directs our lives. You impel us many times to do what your will is, and yet we don't understand it. We have a general idea, as did Paul, but you've not clearly indicated to us the specifics but we know that we must do your will. Father, help us not to be a people who stubbornly insists on knowing all the details before we obey. Help us to learn to obey first, and then as you unfold your plan in our lives, have it revealed to us in a very exciting and thrilling way. Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall, as we looked at the first part of this passage last night, or last week, as we got an overview of what's going on, we saw that Paul is making a checkup loop after he is leaving Ephesus. He traveled through Macedonia, Greece, back to Asia Minor with key stops at Philippi and Troas where the Eutychus incident occurred, and we talked about that. Now we find his other specific stopping points, so you know exactly where he was going on his missionary journey, where he is returning now to Jerusalem. Assos, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, Tregillium, and Miletus. Paul knew that he couldn't get away with a really short stop at Ephesus. He had been with them three years. One of the longest periods of time Paul spent any place was at Ephesus. And that's one of the reasons why we see the book of Ephesians has such deep doctrinal content. When Paul gets to Rome, he's going to spend a good long time there also. And that's one of the reasons why the book of Romans also has such deep doctrinal content. He had taught them all the basic things that they needed to know, and now that they've gotten to a point of spiritual maturity, both at Ephesus and later at Rome, the Apostle Paul is going to be able to give them some incredible doctrinal meat, not merely the milk of the word, but he's going to give them doctrinal meat so that they will know exactly how the Christian life is supposed to function. And I know all of us here, I certainly hope so, love the book of Ephesians, only six chapters long, and the book of Romans, a longer book, but both of those books contain for us some of the most important and sustaining doctrines of the Christian faith. Both those places were places where Paul spent a good deal of time. Of course, in Rome, he spent it under house arrest. <laughs> but uh, in Ephesus, he was a free man. And he was able to communicate a great deal. We'll talk about Romans when we get to the end of the book of Acts, where it tells us he lived in his own hired house for two years uh, when he was there at Rome. And no man forbade anybody to come to him. Uh, he was able to have a full-fledged ministry at government expense when he was at Rome. I think there were, the ACLU, uh, if they were there in those days, probably would have screamed and yelled about that. But God worked it out so that Paul was completely supported because he was a prisoner of Rome, but they also knew he wasn't guilty, so they didn't do with him what they would usually do with a prisoner and stick them into the dungeon. God had worked it out to give an incredible ministry to the Apostle Paul, but we'll get to that when we get to the end of the book of Acts. So here's Paul. He's stopped at Miletus, just a short distance from Ephesus, and he's going to get on board a ship there. He's been walking. Did it ever occur to you? Why would the Apostle Paul feel perfectly free to walk when he had all those assassins out there looking for him? Everybody else got sent on ahead. But Paul decided that he would walk. He was all by himself. Think about the bandits that could have been along the way. Think about the Jews who lay in wait for him so many times. 
think about the fact that they were watching him to see what his next move would be when they might catch him alone by himself. Paul didn't know exactly what the future was going to bring, but he knew this. Every place he stopped, the people said, yes, you're going to get to Jerusalem. But when you get there, you're going to have trouble. So Paul wasn't worried. Every place he stopped, there were prophets who said to him, if you go back to Jerusalem, you are going to suffer. He says, I know that's what's going to happen. But he says, I'm impelled by the Spirit of God to go. I have to go. We saw in chapter 18 why, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But he was impelled to go back, and he wanted to make it by a certain date, the day of Pentecost. And we'll talk about that, the Lord willing, in just a bit. But he was walking. You know, I think the Apostle Paul enjoyed walking. Today, he would probably have been um, one of those guys that gets involved in walking marathons. I had some friends in high school who were into that. I did running, but they did walking. And I had a friend, uh, his name was Glenn Ogden, and uh, he was involved in various walking races, sometimes more than 20 miles for these walking races. And he told me about one. He was about my height, but a very slender build guy, and uh, also a good cross-country runner. And he said, in one of those walking races, there was a guy like six feet, eight inches tall. And he said, we kept neck and neck for the entire distance. And you know, you can't run. If you run, you get disqualified. And he said, that guy had the longest legs. <laughs> and he would stretch them out. And toward the end of the race, he was taking gigantic steps. Glenn said, it was all I could do to keep up with him. <laughs> I think Paul would have probably been into something like that. He loved to walk. I suspect he didn't enjoy traveling by sea quite as much. You don't get to walk anywhere around except the deck of a very small ship. But here he's walking because he has no fear. Something else that's interesting here, Paul had the gift of prophecy. It's very clear. He makes that very clear in many other passages uh, in the New Testament. He had the gift of prophecy. But the gift of prophecy was not designed to benefit the individual who had the gift. Do you remember when we studied the spiritual gifts? We did that a couple of years ago. We went through every one of the spiritual gifts, 22 spiritual gifts. Seven of them are temporary gifts. The remaining 15 are gifts that are still available today. The temporary gifts were apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, which was the ability to receive new special revelation from God and then proclaim that new special revelation. Things that were not revealed in the Old Testament, but are now revealed in the New Testament. Paul describes that for us in Ephesians chapter 3. He also describes the spiritual gifts in Romans chapters 12, 13, and 14, and that chapter 13 right in the middle is that love chapter, but he he explains how love is greater than prophecy in tongues because that was a big problem at the church at Corinth. But those were the seven temporary gifts. Paul had the gift of prophecy. And you recall that when we studied the gift of prophecy, we learned that the gift of prophecy was not given to an individual to benefit himself. It was to benefit others. It was to proclaim truth so that other people would come to Christ. And so Paul, though he had the gift of prophecy, he said, I don't know what's going to happen at Jerusalem. But every place I go, people who have the gift of prophecy are trying to benefit me with it. <laughs> They're telling me that if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be chained up and bad things are going to happen. But he said, I'm already chained up. Did you catch it in the text? He says, I'm already bound in the spirit. I've already got a chain around me, and the chain is dragging me to Jerusalem. Paul knew he had to go. He knew there was bad things on the end of that trip. He didn't know what it was, but he knew that God was in control. Did you know that when, when God is in control, you can look into the future and you can see some bad things coming down the road? Here in the United States, let me ask you a question. As you look, based on what has just been happening recently, as you look into the future and you do not have the gift of prophecy, but you've got, you've got the ability to guess pretty well. You also have the word of God that tells you what's going to happen in the end times. As you look into the future, does it look like bad things are coming? Everybody thinks that bad things may be coming here in the United States. Raise your hand. Yes. We think some bad things are going to be coming. Did you know what? We can be just like the Apostle Paul, bound in the spirit, 
and moving forward, even though we know bad things are coming, and doing it with joy and not with fear, but with expectancy that being in the center of God's will, nothing can happen to us unless God wills it. That's the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. That's the doctrine of his elective purposes. That's the doctrine of predestination. That we have a God who is in control of history. God is not subject to history. God did not look down the corridors of time and see what was going to happen and see who was going to believe and then sort of adjust his plan to fit it and say, well, uh, those people that were going to believe, I saw they were going to believe, and so I'll call them my elect. Nonsense. I saw all the things that were going to happen, and so uh, I sort of rewrote the book and said, well, those are the things I predestined. Or they would have happened anyway, but I I'm going to call it my predestination. God is not subject to history. History is subject to God. God is in control. The world is not in control. The flesh is not in control. The devil is not in control. God is in control because he works all things after the counsel of his own will. And so the Apostle Paul could relax. He could say, yeah, I know bad things are coming. But why worry? I serve a living God, and he never does anything but what's good for me. We know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So Paul could look at it and say, I don't know what it's going to be. It looks bad, but you know what? God's going to make good come out of it. And you know what? God made good come out of it. Now, Paul got beat up a little bit in the process when they saw him there in the temple. And we'll get to that in the next chapter. When they see him there in the temple, they, they think he's brought some Gentiles into the temple. And they get really, really angry. Of course, that's ignorance. He hadn't brought any Gentiles into the temple. They'd seen Trophimus, an Ephesian, with him in the city. They knew that he was in town. But now he's in the temple. And they assume that Trophimus is with him in the temple, which was not the case. He had some other Jews with him fulfilling vows, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But he didn't have Trophimus. Trophimus was not a Jew. Trophimus was not under the law, ever. Trophimus was not fulfilling any vows. And they beat him up a little bit until the chief captain came running down the stairs with a bunch of soldiers that left off beating Paul, it says. And then he rescued him, and then Paul asked him for permission to stand on the stairs and preach, and we'll get to that when we get to that chapter. The Apostle Paul took advantage of every opportunity. He could have said as they were going up the stairs, man, Captain, i got to get out of here. Those people hate me. Let's go. But he didn't. He asked for permission to speak to the very people who were beating him up. Do you use every opportunity? Every opportunity. Even when people are being ugly and nasty. Every opportunity to share Christ. That's what Paul did. He looked at those intersections in his life where he was suffering as opportunities to share Christ. I hope we can learn that lesson. But anyway, back to our text here. And so we find Paul, he knows that a savage spiritual attack is going to happen on him when he gets back to Jerusalem, but he also believes that God is in control. He's going to have an attack that's external. The church at Ephesus is going to have an attack that is external. He's going to have an attack that is internal. There will be people that betray Paul, just like there are going to be people, as he tells them here, that are going to betray the church at Ephesus. Throughout church history, Satan has always had his infiltrators. People who infiltrate a church for the purpose of destroying it. I saw that in my dad's ministry over and over and over again. We had a family that came in. Believe it or not, they were the Adams family. Those of you who are into TV years ago have heard of the Adams family, that family of real weird people. <laughs> you know, ghouls that look sort of like Frankenstein and, you know, weird witch kind of people. Uh, well, this family was the Adams family. I won't tell you their first names because there are plenty of Adams families out there. They came into the church, they had eight kids, they were converted from Roman Catholicism we thought. They got into the church, ingratiated themselves in every way. Their kids were really nice kids. Some of them were a little older than I was, some were a little younger than I was. But what we didn't know 
was they were going around and privately getting people in the church aside or having them over to their home and telling them that the church leadership was all wrong on certain things. And they built up quite a contingency of people in our church. And one Sunday morning, during a morning worship service, the entire group got up from the pews and walked down to the front of the church and tried to throw my dad out of the pulpit. They said God had revealed to them that they had seen a ball of fire that was the Shekinah glory. And God had revealed to them that they were to take over the church. Of course, the elders came up, stood with my dad, and they said, well, we're sorry, but that's not the way it works legally. You can't do that. We have to have a congregational meeting, and you have to give at least a two weeks notice before anything of that nature can transpire. So during those two weeks, they were busy trying to raise other people up in the church to take over the church. The time for the meeting came, and the eldest son of the man who had seen the vision of the ball of fire, and others claimed they had seen it as well, the eldest son stood up and said, now it's clear that God has revealed himself because we have all the charismatic gifts. And I think we should wait just a little bit longer before we take the vote because they didn't have quite enough people to take over. And a little old lady, and I shouldn't say little old lady, I'm approaching the age where she was, <laughs> I was still a few years off of it, but I won't say how old she was, but she walked on a cane and she was about this tall and she was a tough little old lady. And she stood up and took her cane and walked over and wrapped it at the kid. Didn't hit him, but wrapped it at him and said, Young man, sit down. Tonight we're going to vote. And so he sat down. <laughs> he wasn't about to get hit. And they voted. And the contingent group, the group that was trying to take over, walked out of the church in a huff. That was the best thing that ever happened to that church. You know, the next week, you would have thought that there was this huge vacancy in the church. But the next week, every seat in the church was full. The parking lot was full. All the side roads leading to the church were full. God got rid of the people who were busy causing trouble. And then God said, okay, now I can bless. And he did. We don't know exactly who it was at Ephesus from among them own, their own selves sought to raise disciples to follow them to reject the teaching of the Apostle Paul. We don't know what specific doctrines were involved. It might have been charismatic doctrines. It may have been some other doctrines. There may have been some Arminians in the church that didn't like Paul's doctrines of election and predestination. But as soon as the people in our church left, God began to bless in an incredible way and continued to do so. So churches go through the kind of thing that the Apostle Paul is talking about here in this passage in Acts. We talked about how Ephesus was a center of demonism because of the worship of Diana. I think Collingswood is a center of demonism. When you see the types of things that are promoted, and someone stuck in my mailbox today a, an article, I haven't had a chance to read it, but I picked up a couple of lines out of it, that the, our town council has voted to go ahead with a brewery. They want to bring a, 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 a little brewery here into town, into Collingswood. They've already brought in, with gusto, gay marriages. They've already taken stands against various churches in town that preach the gospel, including this one. What we see is the kind of things that we're told will happen in the last days. Do you look at it the way that the Apostle Paul looked at it here in our text tonight? Do you look at it and say, 
it looks like bad things are on the horizon, but I serve a God who is bigger than the bad things. I serve a God who not only knows the end from the beginning, but who has ordained the end from the beginning. That's what prophecy is all about. It's not God says, well, I, I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder what's going to happen during, during the tribulation period. I wonder if there are going to be some judgments. I, I guess I better look down the history and see if there are going to be some judgments. <laughs> is that the way God deals with judgment? Of course not. The very fact that you have prophecy shows that God is in control. And he has a precise time when it's going to happen. And he has a precise set of judgments that he's going to do. And they're in a precise order. And they're designed to bring the earth to repentance. And the earth will not repent. Just like Pharaoh. And so God shows his mighty power so that his name will be glorified. And no one will have an excuse and say, well, I didn't realize there was a God up there. Because it tells us in Revelation chapter 16 when the bold judgments are being poured out. It tells us that they knew God is doing it and they curse him to his face. They refuse to repent. The Apostle Paul knew that God was in control. God was sovereign. God was electing. God was predestinating. God was ordering the events of history in such a way that in the end, he would receive the greatest amount of glory and his people would receive the greatest amount of good. When you look at history like that, you can rejoice no matter what goes on around you. This is temporal. The things that are seen are temporal. But the things that are not seen, says Paul, are eternal. Focus on eternity. Don't focus on time. Focus on the things that are eternal, not the things that are temporal, the things that you can see. Kind of exciting to think about that. Even in a center of demonism, because of the worship of Diana, the Apostle Paul left behind a strong church to which he would write one of the greatest epistles in the New Testament and then told them even there they were going to have trouble. We talked about the seven different ways that you can approach the passage. We talked about approaching it historically, and I've given you some of that tonight. We've looked at the things in their contexts, how the divine intersections of life produce lasting results, and that certainly did produce a lasting result. You've got it in your New Testament not just in the book of Acts, but the book of Ephesians. It can be approached prophetically. We've talked about that a little bit tonight. How because Paul knew the future, he had the gift of prophecy, but he couldn't use it for himself. But others used it to benefit Paul, to let him know what was coming. And so that Paul could take a stand and say to them, I know I'll be bound in Jerusalem. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I know it'll happen because every place I go, that's what they tell me. And those guys have the gift of prophecy. I've got it, but I can't see the specifics. But I know this. I've got a God who's in control of the future, of prophecy, of what's going to happen. It's nice to have that kind of a God, isn't it? Instead of the God of the Arminians, they sit around biting their nails, wonder if he's got everything under control. Did he catch that thing over there? Did he catch that thing over there? Ooh, what about that? Oh! And they sit and worry about it all day long. We don't have to. We have a God who is in control. It can be approached doctrinally. We've talked about that a little bit tonight. We'll talk about it more, the Lord willing, in a few minutes. The key doctrines that Paul emphasized, which are foundational and which the church needed so that they would never compromise. It can be approached personally, the cost of serving in ministry, both to those who minister and to those who receive ministry. It can be approached as a study of the impelling will of God. Paul knowing what he had to do, even though there were other things he would like to do and things that were scary coming down the road. It can be approached as a guide to finishing the end of a ministry and the end of a life. And when Paul gets to Rome, he's going to write some letters to young Timothy and Titus that help them understand as young men what to expect as they go into ministry and as they move down the road. And can it be approached as a crash course for instructing church leadership. Now, tonight I want to pick up one of the things and remind us what we studied back in chapter 18. Verses 13 through 16, it tells us, we went before to ship and sailed into Assos, where they're intending to take in Paul, for so he had appointed, binding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene, and we sailed thence and came the next day over to Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Tergilium, and the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Why does it mention Pentecost here? 
That takes you back to Acts chapter 2. Now, I know that was a long time ago in Acts chapter 2. But on the day of Pentecost, what happened? Acts chapter 1, it tells us that Jesus ascends up to heaven. He gives a commission to them. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. But tarry ye here at Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. See, Jesus fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus fulfilled the Feast of Passover. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. So after the resurrection, he was with them for 40 days. It tells us that specifically in the text. Which meant there was 10 days to Pentecost when Jesus ascended into heaven. And Jesus specifically commanded them, do not split up to obey my commission, which is, you know, go to all these different places, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, under the uttermost parts of the earth. Don't do it in the flesh. Tarry at Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And so they did. And Pentecost is one of the seven great feasts of Israel given in the Old Testament to foreshadow specific things. There's still one feast that has not been fulfilled prophetically yet, and that is the Feast of Trumpets. That's a feast that relate, relates to the return of Jesus Christ. But up through Pentecost, everything has been fulfilled. All the Jewish feasts, their typology, their symbolism, has been fulfilled as we move through the prophetic time calendar of Israel. And we're in a gap right now. In the Old Testament, it was not seen. But it's now revealed, Ephesians chapter 3, under the apostles and prophets by the Spirit, and Paul says that's what a mystery is. He explains a mystery. Things that were not revealed in the Old Testament. Things that are now revealed by the Holy Spirit under the apostles and prophets. And he calls them mysteries. As you trace the word mystery through the New Testament, you discover that there are seven different major areas of theology. Seventeen different major areas of theology that are not revealed in the Old Testament. I encourage you, take your concordance sometime. I know that if we ever get to Ephesians, I'll be talking about the mysteries and going through all 17 of them. 17 specific things that are not revealed in the Old Testament but are revealed in the New Testament. And they're called mysteries in the New Testament. And so the Apostle Paul decided that what he would do is go back to Jerusalem for Pentecost. That was the day the Holy Spirit came. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is God. Even when the Holy Spirit is removed, 2 Thessalonians, where it talks about he that now lets will let until he be taken out of the way, that word let there is the word for hinder. And it's talking about the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit. When we get to the rapture, the Holy Spirit will still be omnipresent. That means he'll still be here on earth. But he will stop one of his very important ministries that he is doing right now, which is restraining lawlessness. Government is not restraining lawlessness. People have looked at that and they said, well, the restrainer is government. No, government's not restraining lawlessness. Government is promoting lawlessness. There are all kinds of things that people have suggested were the fulfillment of that prophecy. No, it hasn't happened yet. Because the Holy Spirit is still restraining things. They are not as bad as they could be. They're bad, but they're not as bad as they could be. There is coming a day when the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is removed from earth, and then people will manifest all of the wickedness that's in their heart. And that's what we see going into the Great Tribulation period. And when the rapture takes place, that restraining ministry, all the believers are gone. All the witnessing is gone. All the working of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers for their neighbors to see is gone. You wouldn't want to be on earth when that happens. Pentecost. The Apostle Paul apparently had taken a vow for a specific period of time. We are never told how long it would be, but you recall a number of weeks ago when we were in Acts chapter 18, we studied the vows of the Old Testament. What were the regulations of, for the vows? There's a great deal of detail given to us in the Old Testament concerning vows. And we were told in Acts chapter 18 that Paul had taken on him a vow. Acts 18, 
I'll start reading in verse 12. The verse that tells us he took on the vow is uh, verse 18, but let's start reading in verse 12. And when Gallio was deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, now talk about a false accusation. This is what they said. This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, as we're going to discover in a couple of verses, the answer to that is actually no, because Paul was fulfilling the law of vows in this immediate context. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge in such manner, matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. And as we learned when we went through this passage, apparently this was the point at which Sosthenes said, you know, what Paul has been preaching must be pretty good because Sosthenes gets saved. That was incredible. We won't go back into that right now. The chief ruler of the synagogue beat him before the judgment seat. Gallio cared for these things. And after Paul had tarried there yet a good while, then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. Notice the last two phrases. Having shorn his head, for he had a vow. That was the Nazarite vow. And we talked about what the Nazarite vow was. Nazarite and Nazarene are not the same thing. A Nazarene is somebody from Nazareth. Jesus was a Nazarene. He was not a Nazarite. Nazarite vow was where a man would allow his hair to grow for a specific period of time to demonstrate openly and publicly that he had taken on a vow to do something for God. It was a visible external sign. We talked about how our work should be seen before men that they might glorify God who is in heaven. We talked about that a good deal this morning. Well, the way they did it in the Old Testament was an individual could take a Nazarite vow. And Paul had apparently done that because Paul shaved his head. He must have done that prior to his salvation because we're no longer under the law of vows of the Old Testament. Now, if you make a vow, you've got to keep it. But we're not under the specific laws of vows of the Old Testament. Now, Paul has shaved his head, and to complete your vow, you have to go back to Jerusalem. So he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. What feast? We've just been told in chapter 20. It's the feast of Pentecost that Paul wants to go back to. But I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and had gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Now, in the very next chapter, in chapter 21, we're going to see Paul finishing off his vow. And he's going to be finishing it off with some other people who have the same kind of vow, which would close out his responsibilities that he had taken under the law. Chapter 21, verse 15 and following. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem there went up with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Manasin of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. We're going to learn some exciting things about Manasin. When we get to chapter 21, I hope you get excited about what you learn about Manasin. Because most of us here are old. <laughs> Manasin got his name stuck in the Bible. Oh, I'm going to save it for then. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews are there which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Paul had a ministry to Gentiles. The rest of the apostles had ministry to Jews. The rest of the apostles had been at the Feast of Pentecost when it was fulfilled, a Jewish holiday. It was at the Feast of the Pentecost that the Holy Spirit had been given in a new and special way, had begun new ministries whereby he not only came upon people, 
He came upon people in the Old Testament. We saw many illustrations of that, including people like Samson, who was really sort of a bad guy in a lot of ways. But the Holy Spirit would come upon him for power. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul, King Saul, at various occasions, when he was running around trying to catch David, and the Holy Spirit stopped him from doing it because as the Spirit came on Saul, Saul lay on the ground and prophesied. And people said, is Saul also among the prophets? The Holy Spirit came on people in the Old Testament, but he departed. But now the Holy Spirit permanently indwells every believer. The moment you trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit came and began to live inside of you. That's why it's possible to live the Christian life. You couldn't do it in the flesh, but you can do it in the Spirit. Paul says that we are to walk in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We can grieve the Spirit. We can quench the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit never leaves us. Every time you sin, just remember you're either quenching or grieving the Spirit. When you sin and do something evil, you are grieving the Spirit. When you substitute something in the flesh for the work of the Holy Spirit, you are quenching the Spirit. For example, it can be on either end of the spectrum. People who are into great formalistic ritual by which they think they are somehow gaining merit with God, and they wear their robes and they swing their incense gizmos with the incense coming out of them and they do funny chants and all that kind of stuff. Formalism can quench the Spirit of God because the Spirit doesn't have any place to work in that kind of a situation. Or you can quench the Spirit with all the charismatic nonsense, all the enthusiasm whereby it's not the Spirit working, it's the flesh working. That's the quenching of the Spirit, two ends of the spectrum. But grieving the Spirit takes place every time you sin. How often have we grieved the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption? I'm not going to go over it again, but you know that there are 31 different specific works of the Holy Spirit that he does at the moment of salvation. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's a royal seal. Nobody breaks a royal seal. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit will never leave you. The Holy Spirit always dwells in you. He's always there when you sin. And that's why it grieves him. Dear people, if we understood, not merely in our head, but in our hearts, the theology that the Apostle Paul teaches, it would certainly keep us from sin. Paul wanted to be back on the day of Pentecost. That was the, the feast day that symbolized the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he had worked out his vow so that he could be in Jerusalem on Pentecost, the day when the Spirit of God was given in this new and special way to those who place their faith in Christ. To him, symbolism was very important. And so we see him heading back on Pentecost. And so it goes on here. It says, you know how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Everybody knew about Paul and his ministry. Now, what was the accusation that had been made before? You remember the accusation that his detractors had made back in chapter 18, verse 13? They brought him to the judgment seat of Gallio and said, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. What's Paul doing at this point? He's coming back to fulfill a vow that he made under the law. Here we find that that news has gotten back to Jerusalem about the same thing. You know, that's the guy. He's out there. And yeah, there are a lot of Gentiles coming to Christ. But you know what? The Apostle Paul is, is telling him all kinds of things about the law that are wrong. You know, we dealt with that issue in chapter 15. There was a a great council of Jerusalem, the first worldwide church council, if you will. But they were all believers then, not like the ecumenical movement today. And they determined certain things about the Gentiles that the Gentiles were not under the law. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And so now that information, in a muddled sort of way, has gotten back to the church at Jerusalem. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this 
But we say unto thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. Do you know what vow it was? It was the exact same vow that Paul had taken that we saw him working out back at Sancria, where he shaved his head, for he had a vow. Look at this. Take them, purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads. They all had Nazarite vows. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Now, we're going to talk about that when we get over to chapter 21, because people say, what? Did Paul place himself back under the law? I thought he said we're no longer under the law. I mean, what is he writing in Romans? What is he writing in Galatians about us no longer being under the law? Well, you're going to have to wait till chapter 21 to answer that question. But what I want you to see tonight is what we have going on. And the reason Paul wanted to get back to Jerusalem for Pentecost was because of the vow that he'd taken concerning a, a Nazarite vow in chapter 18 and where he is fulfilling it in chapter 21, where there are four other guys who also had the same kind of vow who was fulfilling it on that same day. And so it's with that group of men that he's going to the temple so that he can fi finish off the last few remaining items that have to take place under the Nazarite vow. And we talked about that in detail in chapter 18, so we'll not cover it again here. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded, that was back in chapter 15, that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood, and from strangled, and from fornication. Those, those are things that Paul said, if you, or that the council had determined in Jerusalem, if you want to have a good testimony to the people around you, and, and Paul deals with the issue of things offered to idols. We talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. There are several places where Paul deals with the issue about meat offered unto idols, and from blood, and what an offense that was to a Jew, and things strangled. You, you know, got to do it the kosher way. Slit their throats, let the blood drain out and from fornication, a moral impurity. Then Paul took the man, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Things coming up. Things in the text. If you pay attention to what's going on, you see the connection between chapters in the text. It's not merely a running narrative, which has no connection to anything else. You discover the reasons that Paul did certain things was because Paul was determined to keep all of his promises to God. Do you keep your promises to God? Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Ecclesiastes. Why should thy mouth cause thy flesh to sin? You don't want to say, oh man, I didn't realize all the implications of that and I made this promise to God and, you know, but really at this point I really don't think I want to keep that promise. Have you made some promises to God? Think back over the years. What kind of things have you promised God? Did you keep them? Can you think of anything that you promised God at some point in your life? And then you decided later you weren't going to keep that promise. You didn't think the Lord was leading you in that way. God expects us to fulfill our promises to him. There are some important lessons to learn out of the text tonight. I pray that by the grace of God... We will learn them and keep our promises to God. And as we keep our promises, we'll see his blessing in our lives. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here tonight to study your word. Some serious issues that we've looked at tonight, historic issues, prophetic issues, issues that relate to the way in which the Apostle Paul functioned so that he might most perfectly fulfill the commission that you'd called him to fulfill. How he kept his vows to you. Father, we pray that you'll help us to remember not to open our mouth and make promises that we don't keep. Certainly not to make promises to you that we don't keep. We've tried to bargain with you in the past. We've said, oh Lord, if you do this, then I'll do that. Or if you do that, I'll do this. 
Father, help us to remember that you don't cut deals. You didn't cut deals with Pharaoh, and you're not going to cut deals with us. You've called us to obey. Regardless of the cost, you've called us to obey. And so, Father, we pray that you will teach us obedience with joy, even when we don't understand all the ramifications, all the implications for the future, that we would obey in the present, even if we see scary things coming down the road, that we would obey. And then leave the results to you. For you are far better at producing the results that you want to accomplish your goals and your purpose, for you have predestinated all things according to the counsel of your own will. Make us your servants who joyfully look forward into the future to that which you have in store. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.